Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Katherine Harris. I am a program manager at the South Carolina Commission on Higher Education. Today, I'm joined by two of my colleagues, Ms. Tanya Weigold. She is a program coordinator at the South Carolina Commission um, Higher Education for Student Affairs in the Scholarships and Grants area, and Dr. Garrick Hampton, who is our Associate Director of Student Affairs at the Commission. So today we are presenting on how to retain your state scholarship or grant. This is primarily related to students who are currently receiving either a South Carolina state scholarship or grant or incoming students. So we will go ahead and get started. So today we are going to specifically discuss um, the requirements to retain your scholarship for the South Carolina Hope Scholarship, the Life Scholarship, the Palmetto Fellows Scholarship, as well as the South Carolina Need-Based Grant and Lottery Tuition Assistance Program, which is commonly called LTAP. At this time, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Garrett Campton to talk about the South Carolina Hope and Life Scholarships. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thank y'all for joining us today. Um, so first, we'll start out just talking about our HOPE recipients. And for anybody who's in that in that category, uh, you all qualify for the HOPE scholarship in your first year at a four-year institution um, by having a 3.0 final high school GPA. Um, and so you receive the HOPE scholarship at a four-year institution here in uh, South Carolina. Uh, your next step is going to be to try to transition to the Life Scholarship Program. In order to do that, you want a 3.0 Life GPA, and we'll talk about that in a second, and an average of 30 credit hours by the end of this first year. And the reason we say average is because we understand students may come in um, with APIB or uh, dual enrollment credit hours from high school. Um, and some of, you, some of you may also be mid-year starts. And what that means is you started your very first semester in college um, as, a, as a college student in January. Um, so we say average in those two different instances because if you started in the fall, you're gonna shoot for 30 credit hours total at least. Um, and then if you started in the spring, and this is important because we see a lot of students um, miss on this, if you started in January, so if your very first college, if your very first semester of college was a spring term, so you started in January perhaps, you are responsible for a 3.0 life GPA and at least 15 credit hours by the end of summer. That's how you successfully move from um, either hope to life or actually from life to life if you start mid-year. Uh, so I don't want you to guys to be, to come, uh, be under the impression that you get the spring and then next fall. That is not the case. You get this spring and this summer um, you need a 3.0 and 15, and if you do that, you will already have the scholarship on your um, on your account for the next fall term, and you'll have it the whole next year. You can go to the next slide. So we talked about a life GPA, and the life GPA is essentially your college GPA um, of all the college courses you've taken, and these are all things that go into it. So. Um, grades earned at all colleges, whether it was your college or a transfer college. Um, so if you do anything over the summer, that should go back into the life GPA as well. Uh, grades and credit hours earned um, in your traditional college term. Um, F grades and D grades do count. So please be sure and check with your institution, check your transcript. But F grades and do, D grades do count in this calculation. And then this last one is something we just talk about because, again, it's one of the things that we, we see quite frequently. So dual enrollment, dual enrollment for anybody who doesn't know are the college classes that you took while you were in high school. Uh, they can be through a four-year institution, but most of the time it's going to be through your local two-year or technical college. Um, and as Ms. Ms. Harris had just said, if you guys have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Uh, we'll address them as we move forward, uh, but just feel, feel free to ask whatever it is you want to ask. This is why we're here. Um, so going back to the life GPA, of course, um, with dual enrollment. We talk about this just because we see more and more students um, have these challenges. Uh, dual enrollment, again, class stick in high school. So what happens is this, you're gonna go the first year, some of you are coming out of your first year in college, and you're gonna get whatever grades you earned over the fall and the spring, and even over the summer. What's gonna happen with the life GPA is this, at the end of this summer, at the end of this academic year, your college now has to calculate what's called your life GPA, which means they got to go back and get all the college grades, and that includes dual enrollment. So what we see is this. We see students go through the first year in college, and that first fall, spring, and summer, they've earned a 3.0. They've gotten all Bs, let's just say. 
However, when that student was in high school, and some of you are taking dual enrollment even earlier um, than senior year, some of you take it in sophomores, and some of you taking it as juniors, we had students that had taken dual enrollment and they got maybe a C. And what happens is the college then has to calculate even that C in high school into a calculation with your grades for this first year. And that calculation of all those grades needs to be a 3.0, and that does include the dual enrollment. So what we see a lot is once that dual enrollment is included, um, it can bring a student down below a 3.0. And in most cases that happens, um, the calculation happens after registration for summer school. And so the student never really had an opportunity to um, take the class over or get different or get better grades over the summer or register for summer to be sure they made up for those grades in high school. So again, this is a good time because I think summer registration is still open for a lot of you. If you can go back, if you took dual enrollment, just go back and do a calculation or have your college help you with the calculation that includes your dual enrollment grades and be sure when that calculation is done, you are still above a 3.0 life GPA. That will help so many of you uh, maintain and keep that scholarship. Okay, and so we also want to give you a section where we just kind of pull back the curtain on the life GPA. So when you go to talk to your institution, or if you want to do this at home, I still would encourage you to go back with your institution and check. Um, and most institutions, if not all, have a place on your system, on your student account, where they can, where you can see your life GPA. Uh, but we just kind of wanted to give you a feel for how the calculation is actually done. So what happens is this, the institution has a system that will take all your quality points, and the quality points are just the credit, or just the points assigned to whatever grade you get in the class. Um, so it'll depend on your grading scale in most cases. So for example, um, some schools assign four quality points to an A, for example. Um, They'll take the quality points that you get for that course, they'll multiply that by the hours assigned to that course, um, and that's how they get the value for that course. So, for example, if you have a school that assigns an A, up uh, four points to an A, and you take a three hour course, that's going to give you 12 overall um, points that you would put into your calculation. You're going to add up all the points, all the quality points, you're going to add up all the eligible GPA hours. You're going to divide those, and that's going to give you your life that give you your life GPA, and that's what needs to be above a 3.0. So we give you an example here um, on the screen that gives you what it looks like with a dual enrollment class. And again, we focus on dual enrollment because as we see more and more students with dual enrollment, um, we're starting to see more and more students really need to do these calculations. Uh, so you can see in this on this sample transcript, the student actually had six credit hours from dual enrollment. They had a C and they had a D. So you remember we talked about all this does need to be included in that calculation because it's dual enrollment. So when the student uh, takes their institutional GPA, and again, this is just what they did at the school, uh, um, at their home institution, they get 91 quality points to divide that by 27 credit hours, and the institutional GPA is a 3.37. So this is that student that's going to look at that just the institutional and think they're fine. However, this is why we're telling you go back and look at your dual enrollment and be sure you're good because once this dual enrollment, that D and that C, uh, remember it's the point and the hours that have to go into the, to the denominator as well. Once that's added back into the calculation or included in the calculation, this student actually ended up with 106 quality points and 36 credit GPA hours. And so this student's life GPA, which is what the college has to go by by law, they don't have an option, is a 2.94. So this is a really good example of how your institutional GPA can look really good, uh, or at least good enough to keep, keep your scholarship. But the law says life GPA, and that life GPA is actually below what the student needs. So again, the moral here, the, the moral of the story is this. Check your dual enrollment, check with your institution, do it now before summer school registration closes, even for summer two. Um, Y'all, even if the class ends after, uh, slightly after August, before, you, before your fall starts, as long as that course is considered a summer course, it can be included in that calculation. So you want to be sure that you guys are in good standing when dual enrollment are, is calculated, um, just so you be sure you're good for the next year. And so, of course, this is how you keep the life scholarship. We want a 3.0 life GPA. We just talked about that. And then 30 credit hours after year one, uh, 60 after year two, 90 after year three. Remember, this is all totals. Uh, so we'll let you bank hours or include hours. So, for example, if you have 33 hours after the first year, you technically only need 27 at the end of that, uh, to add it to that for year two, because you want to be at a total of 60 and then 90. And, of course, we still add AP 
IB dual enrollment CLEP. If you are a mid-year start student, again, you started in January, your clock is a little different or your hours are a little different. You'll need 15 after that first spring and summer, but then it's 30 after that. So 45, 75, and then 105 to get your last fall term. And I think this is my last one. So just for example, uh, what if I lose my life scholarship? One of the great things about the life program is that it allows different entry points as long as you were a resident um, when you started college. So let's say you have the life scholarship for your freshman year. Uh, for some reason, you don't get it for the sophomore year. You can actually earn it back for your junior year as long as you met the requirements. So at that point, 3.0, 60 credit hours, because that's after two years. You could actually pick the scholarship back up for two more years. Uh, the one thing you want to remember about this is that that year that you did not have the scholarship actually counts as one of your four used years. So you would only have two remaining. So you used two, you have two left. Um, we also have an appeal process, but Ms. Weigold, I believe we'll talk about that a little bit later. And so with that, I believe I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Harris to talk about Pamela Fellows. Thank you, Dr. Hampton. So for our Palmetto Fellows Scholarship recipients, our criteria are slightly different from the Life Scholarship. The Palmetto Fellows uh, Scholarship requires a student to have a 3.0 institutional, which is a home institution GPA. So that means at the student's home institution where they are enrolled in their degree program, um, they must also earn 30 credit hours annually each academic year. So as Dr. Hampton touched on this, our academic year at CHE starts with the fall term. It runs fall, spring, summer is our trailer. Um, so students have summer term to uh, take coursework to try and meet these requirements if they have not met them by the end of the spring term. So if a student is short on um, credit hours or GPA, they do have the ability to attend in the summer to try and make up that deficit. So credit hours can be taken at any institution as long as the student's home institution will accept those credit hours towards their degree program. So the student would need to speak with their academic advisor, the registrar's office and get approval for credit hours at another institution of coursework um, to see if that would be accepted. If a student is short on their GPA, because that is a home institution GPA, that student will need to take classes at their home institution for the summer um, in order to increase their GPA. Uh, the other piece of advice I would give our students if they are looking at GPA issues to make sure they are meeting with their academic advisor to take advantage of any institutional appeal uh, processes that may have in place that could, ad could adjust that. Um, and the caveat to that is if you use an institutional process such as grade forgiveness, um, please be cognizant of what that is going to do to the credit hours that you have earned. So if you utilize grade forgiveness, you will only be able to count the credit hours from that course one time, but you need to be aware of the timing of when you utilize that. So if, for example, a student took a course and got a failing grade, we'll just say an F, and they meet with their academic advisor, they decide that they are going to utilize grade forgiveness. They submit the paperwork. When they do that, it will pull those credit hours back out that they completed until the student takes it again and replaces them. So if the student was counting the credit hours from a, a failing grade, a D and F, um, that is hurting their GPA um, in their 30 annual, grade for forgiveness could affect that. So the student just needs to be cognizant, meet with their academic advisor, a financial aid counselor, and discuss exactly what they are doing before they utilize um, institutional processes. Next slide, please, Tanya. Thank you. So at that point, we're gonna talk about the South Carolina Need-Based Grant. And the South Carolina Need-Based Grant 
is a little different. The requirements to get a South Carolina need-based grant is the student must file the free application for federal student aid each academic year. So that typically opens up on October 1st. I say typically next year is going to be slightly different. So please pay attention to when the Department of Education has the FAFSA application out so that we can get that filed. Our need-based grant funding is first come first serve. Um, so the student needs to file that application as soon as possible in order to be considered eligible. The student must maintain a 2.0 um, institutional GPA, and they must earn at least 24 credit hours if the student is full-time. If they are part-time, it would be 12 credit hours. Um, the one caveat I will add to the South Carolina need-based grant is that the institutions set their own awarding parameters for those funds. So if you want to be very specific about what you need to earn the need-based grant for next year, the financial aid office at your institution would be able to, to share that with you. These are what is required in the regulations um, in order for the student to be awarded. No. And so lastly, we have the um, South Carolina tuition grant. So the difference between the South Carolina need-based grant and the South Carolina tuition grant is that the South Carolina need-based grant is only for our students that attend public institutions. However, for our students that attend independent institutions in South Carolina, they will still receive need-based grant funding through the South Carolina tuition grant. The South Carolina Tuition Grant is administered by the South Carolina Tuition Grants Commission. So we would absolutely refer you to them, but as listed on their website, their requirements are the student must file the free application for federal student aid each year. They do have a deadline of June 30th. So that's at the very end of the year. Um, they must demonstrate financial need as calculated through the, the FAFSA application. The student must be enrolled full-time um, or at least 12 credit hours each term in order to receive disbursement. And they must be meeting satisfactory academic progress. Um, your financial aid office will calculate that at each institution. But those are the requirements for the South Carolina tuition grant for independent institutions. If you attend an independent institution, you have any questions, we would um, encourage you to reach out to the tuition grants commission directly. Next slide, please. And that takes us to the Lottery Tuition Assistance Program. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Ms. Tanya Weigold. So good afternoon, everybody. If you are attending one of our two-year institutions in South Carolina, um, you may be receiving the Lottery Tuition Assistance Program. As Katie mentioned earlier, we usually call it LTAP. In order to retain your LTAP funding, you do need to complete the free application for federal student aid every year or a FAFSA waiver. And then after you've completed 24 credit hours, you do need to maintain a 2.0 GPA in order to be uh, eligible for lottery tuition assistance program. So we, we briefly discussed this during um, the Life Scholarship and the Palmetto Fellows Scholarship, but what if you experience an extenuating circumstance that prevents you from meeting one of the scholarship requirements? So regardless what scholarship or grant that you have, you were not able to meet the credit hours and or the GPA in order to retain your scholarship for the next year due to a traumatic event or an extenuating circumstance. Um, so one of the things that we mentioned for all the programs is to attend summer school. You can bring up your life GPA or your institutional GPA, and you can earn additional credit hours to help um, maintain your scholarship programs. The other that Katie mentioned is the um, academic forgiveness program. So talk to your academic advisor, see if you can retake a course to remove a D or F grade off of your transcript and add, um, you know, the, the C, B or A grade that you earned in that class. And as Katie mentioned, you need to be really careful and talk with your academic advisor to see if those credit hours will change in effect. Uh, so you increase your GPA, but then your credit hours change. So um, it's important to work hand in hand with your academic advisor to make sure that you have all the information. And then last, uh, the institutional appeals process. So each institution has an appeals process. If you lost one of your uh, state scholarships or you lost one of your institutional scholarships, um, they have an appeals process that you can go through for extenuating circumstance. Um, so we do ask that you, you go through that first. 
last but not least, we do have a state scholarship appeals process. So again, if you've experienced an extenuating circumstance or a traumatic event that prevented you from meeting the scholarship requirements, you can go through the um, state scholarship appeals process, which is on our website, um, which is www.chesc.gov, and you'll be able to find scholarship appeals. The appeals process is currently open. So we have the guidelines on our website and it discusses what information you need to submit. Um, but ultimately, you submit the application, a student letter explaining why you're appealing, all transcripts from all institutions attended, including dual enrollment, and then supporting documentation um, about why you're appealing. You would submit that to CHE, we would review that information, and a decision would be made regarding your state scholarship or grant. There's some other campus resources that we hope you're utilizing in order to maintain your state scholarships and grants. So each institution usually has a writing center to help you formulate essays or read your essays to help you um, edit them. And they also have math labs to help you with any math homework you may have. There's tutoring and supplemental instruction depending on what institution you're at, but there's definitely a tutoring center or tutors available to help you in your courses if you're struggling in any of those. There is the Office of Accessibility Services. So if you had an IEP in high school or you have documented disabilities, you have the ability to go to the Office of Accessibility Services and see if there's any accommodations available for you. One of the accommodations that you may be able to receive is a reduced course load. So as Dr. Hampton and Ms. Harris discussed, the requirements were 30 credit hours each academic year to retain your state scholarships. However, if you have an approved reduced course load through the Office of Accessibility Services, your particular renewal requirements will be different. So for example, let's say that you and the Accessibility um, Office decide that 12 credit hours is in your best interest instead of 15 um, each term, then your renewal requirements would be 24 credit hours at the end of the academic year with a 3.0 life GPA or 3.0 institutional GPA, depending on your scholarship. You do need to go get this uh, paperwork approved every year, um, usually at the beginning of the academic year. So um, you would be working on that process over the summer or in the beginning of the fall to get that information approved. Um, but we're happy to answer any questions regarding that. And then last but not least, please utilize your academic advisors and your financial aid office. Your financial aid office is the one who is determining your eligibility and awarding your scholarships. So if you have any questions about why you, the scholarship is not in your account, they should be your first point of contact because they can tell you exactly why um, your scholarship may be missing. However, we are always available to answer any questions you may have. Um, so... What questions do we have? We do, I do see that we have some questions and hand raised. So we'll go ahead and start, uh, Tanya, if it's okay, with the questions that we got in the chat. And we do see there was one hand raised. Um, so the first question we have are, when are GPAs updated from the semester that just concluded? So this is a general question. <laughs> um, we will, so I'm assuming they're referring to the spring term, which um, is some institutions has just concluded or will be concluding soon. Um, and to be honest, that is probably a question that you will have to contact your institution to determine when your grades will be posted. Um, usually when the, the deadline for grades is when they update the, the transcripts, which would then update your GPA. Um, does anybody have anything they'd like to add to that? <laughs> okay. So our second question is a general, it looks like a transfer question. Um, transferring from another state college, will I include all credit hours? So I'm not sure which scholarship we're referring to here um, for the, well, Dr. Hamden, do you want to say how that would apply to the life? Yeah, so for the life program, um, all credit hours are going to be included unless they're considered remedial, developmental, or non-degree credit. So that might mean you have to look in the course catalog at your school and just be sure it's not listed as a non-degree credit course. 
Um, but as long as it's not one of those three things, you're receiving college, um, might not take it for graduation purposes, um, and which, which for life doesn't necessarily matter, um, but, but it still could be included or still should be included for life scholarship purposes. So even if they don't take it and put it towards a particular degree program at your new institution, um, again, as long as it was a remedial developmental or non-degree credit, uh, they would consider it towards your 30, 60, or 90 needed for a life scholarship. And I'll let Ms. Harris take the take Palmetto Fellows. Thank you, Dr. Hamden. So for Palmetto Fellows, um, it would be institution or credit hours at your home institution. So obviously you're transferring. So what I would suggest is that you, um, once your final transcript has been sent to your new institution, they will review that and look at the coursework that they are um, accepting towards your degree program. But obviously you completed those credit hours at your previous institution. So what I would suggest is that you reach out to the financial aid office at your new South Carolina institution, and they can review those credit hours with you that they have applied towards graduation purposes and exactly where you are in terms of the 30 annual. And then that way um, there won't be any confusion about assumed credit hours from your, your previous institution. Uh, the next question we have is I'm in my second year of college. I will be done with my nursing program in December. They only have me taking 10 credit hours in the fall semester. Does that not qualify me for the life scholarship, even if I continue schooling into the next year? So I'm going to allow Dr. Hampton to handle that one. So unless you are in your very last semester of the scholarship, and right now that's um, semester seven or eight at an eligible school, you are required to be in at least 12 credit hours of coursework. That's considered full time. Um, and so, yes, if you are enrolled in 10 credit hours in the fall, you are technically not in enough credit hours to receive the life scholarship. So you probably would need to go back and talk with your institution about a plan to complete your degree program, um, adding two more credit hours to that fall term. Thank you, Dr. Hampton. So our next question is also a life question. Um, is it safe to assume that transfer students who maintain their GPA for the life scholarship will be included in the financial aid package once they submit proof of residency and current transcripts have been submitted as well? Um, and I've noticed there are some financial aid folks on this call. I'm still going to say this. I would not assume anything. Um, we, we have said multiple times in this presentation to contact your financial aid office. Um, and we do that for a reason. We at the commission don't, don't have access to anybody's academic criteria or, or transcripts or history here. We work with the institutions to administer that program. So any questions about, am I for sure going to be eligible? What is my GPA for sure? How many credit hours I have for sure? Always, always, always want to be directed back to your institution's financial aid office because they're, they're the ones that actually has that answer to the question. So I would start off by saying this. I, I wouldn't assume anything. Um, now, you can feel better about it um, because, yes, if you've met the criteria at the end of the year, it should be included in your package. Um, but then you, you pointed out some good hurdles here. They're going to check you again for residency. They're going to check you for cost of attendance. Um, so they're going to check various things at the institution. So I would work hand in hand with your institution's financial aid office. Um, like I said, you can feel good about it. Uh, but ultimately, they may see something that you didn't think about or we didn't think about. Um, so, yeah, that's a good starting place, but definitely check with your school on that. Um, so the next question is a general question. It says, what about classes they exempted in college? I'm not sure I understand that question. Does anybody want to take a stab at that? So... Uh, and Tanya, if you want to jump in, go ahead. But um, so I am assuming the student you're talking in a case where a student may have taken an examination that's giving you the credit for the course um, for life. As long as you can see those credit hours on a transcript, then they do count towards that 30, 60, 90. Uh, but I would, again, always check with the institution and be sure that you've truly gotten that credit and it's truly been placed on a transcript. Exempted credit should show up on a transcript. 
um, as credit that's been earned by you. And in, in terms of CLEP exempted coursework for Palmetto Fellows, we do not count that as part of the 30 earned annual. So you, you are eligible to participate that in that to, um, you know, CLEP out of coursework. However, those credit hours from CLEP exempted coursework would not count towards your annual 30 earned. Um, the next question is a lottery tuition grant question. So we're going to have Ms. Weigel take this. And it says, does the SAP lottery grant still apply if your student loans are in default? So I might need you guys to help me with this. But my understanding is that uh, there's also some general eligibility requirements in order to be eligible for any of our state scholarship or grant programs. So that includes being a resident in South Carolina, not having a second uh, drug or alcohol misdemeanor, and you can't be in default of any student lo um, student loans. And so I believe if you're in default of any of your loans, you will not be eligible for lottery tuition assistance. Thank you, Ms. Weigel. Um, the next question says, if we applied for a scholarship, how do we know if we were approved? So I'm going to, I'm going to start with this. So out of our state scholarships at CHE, which would be the South Carolina Hope, the Life Scholarship and the Palmetto Fellows, the Palmetto Fellows is the only scholarship that has an application. The South Carolina Hope and the Life are evaluated by staff at the financial aid institution or the financial aid offices at your institution, and they review the student's uh, credentials and they award if the student has met the criteria. Um, so for Palmetto Fellows, the application process begins in the student's senior year of high school with their high school counselor. As we get those applications, they are processed. If the student, um, once the student's application is processed, the student will receive an email from the commission um, either way if it was approved or if the student was determined to be ineligible, they will get an email telling them where they were um, short in meeting the criteria for the Palmetto Fellows. So they would receive an email either way. The one thing I will tell you is please make sure your students are checking their spam or junk folders in their emails because we do send them in batches. Um, and a lot of times they end up missing those emails. But if you had a student with a Palmetto Fellows application, you haven't heard anything, um, our contact information is on the next slide. Please reach out to myself or Tanya. We can check the status of that Palmetto Fellows application for you. Uh, the next question is, so if my student had an IEP in high school, but came in with 48 credits from dual enrollment, can they decide to take fewer classes instead of needing to request a reduced course load accommodation. So I'll start with this and then I will kick it over to Dr. Hampton to handle the life. In terms of Palmetto Fellows, Palmetto Fellows is tricky because it requires 30 earned annually. We don't consider dual enrollment in the credit hour completion for Palmetto Fellows. So in terms of Palmetto Fellows, your answer would be no. You would need to do the appropriate coursework for a reduced course load um, in order for your student to be able to meet the renewal requirements at the end of the year. And then I will kick it over to Dr. Hampton to explain how this would affect the life. So with life, because you can use the average, um, your, your targets in a normal year are gonna be again, 30 after the first year, 60 after the second, 90 after the third. If you come in with significant dual enrollment, um, then you could go the route of not going through um, the Office of Disabilities um, and, and still meet your credit hour requirement for that reduced load. Two things I would remind you of, though, is that one, you still have to do at least 12 credit hours a sem uh, semester for life. Uh, so there's the floor there is 20, the floor there is 12 or 24 for the year, unless you have that reduced course load. The other thing I would say is this, the reduced course load is not the only reason to go to the Office of Disabilities. There may be some other accommodations you could get, extended test time, a clear uh, quiet testing environment, um, recorders, um, things to help you take notes, um, able to eat snacks in class, able to take bathroom breaks. We see all kinds of things um, that, that you may need to be successful. So 
I would say it's not the only reason to go to the Office of Disabilities, um, but if you're just looking for the for the credit hours, there is some flexibility there for life that may allow you um, to only take 12 credit hours a semester and you'd still meet that mark based on your dual enrollment possibly. Thank you, Dr. Hampton. Um, our next question, are all the funds for the South Carolina need-based grant already used up for the upcoming fall 23-24 year? So I'll go ahead and handle this. Um, we don't have our funding for next year yet. The budget, it won't be finalized until um, the General Assembly and the governor sign off on it. And um, usually the General Assembly takes their final vote in May, and then the governor has to um, sign it. So we don't quite yet know exactly how much funding we're going to have for the 23-24 academic year yet. Um, so the awards that the institutions in South Carolina are giving you right now are estimated off of um, either this year's funding or last year's funding. Um, each institution will do that differently. So um, we, we hope to know at the end of this month how much money we'll have for next year, but that's going to be contingent upon the budget, the Appropriations Act, and the budget being officially signed by Governor McMaster. Um, do we have to apply for South Carolina grants considering I moved to South Carolina in 2019 and started school in 2020? Dr. Hampton, would you like to take this residency question? Uh, sure. So, um, so remember now, the only one that requires an official application is Pamela Fellows, and that requires an application out of high school. So we're probably not talking about that award here. The applications for a lottery and need-based are going to be the FAFSA. So most of you should, and, and well, we encourage everybody to do a FAFSA each year. Um, each of the scholarships remaining ones anyway for Life and Hope actually require you to be a South Carolina resident at the time you graduated high school and start college. So that's gonna be your first question. When I started college for the first time, was I a South Carolina resident or dependent of a resident? And I don't want you to try to make that decision on this call. Um, again, the college has people that's there and I can actually, if you'll give me a call, I can probably help you figure that out as well. Um, so we can see if that's a starting point. Assuming you were a resident at the time of high school graduation or were dependent, because uh, there's a couple of different ways that can happen for the life scholarship or hope scholarship, or I guess life scholarship, you should not have to do an application because again, there isn't one. Um, but I do know this just from working with a lot of different schools, a lot of different schools for transfer students um, have a policy that you need to self identify. So again, we're back to that place where check in with the financial aid office because some schools, if you don't ever go to them and say, hey, I'm here, I've been here, I moved here, I'm a transfer student. Um, even if you graduated high school here and went out of state and come back, they're not just holding you in a system like that. So you do need to self-identify. That just means go to the office, have a conversation, tell them you'd like to be considered for the life scholarship. I know at least two major, major colleges here have that policy in place. Um, so you may be eligible. Uh, we got to figure out the residency, uh, but then definitely go to the financial aid office to figure that out. Thank you, Dr. Hampton. Um, next question. What if you began college in a different state? Can you explain how the process works in regards to once you are attending an institution here in South Carolina? Um, so basically just to piggyback off what Dr. Hampton just reiterated, it's going to depend on if you were a South Carolina resident at the time of high school graduation and when you initially enrolled in college, um, even if you enrolled in college in another state. Um, so at this point, we would just refer you to your institution. Um, they'll be able to take a look at your criteria and determine if you met the residency requirements and if you are able to be awarded um, the life scholarship or any of our grant scholarships um, and go from there. But if you have specific questions or wanna go in depth further, you by all means can um, give us a call and we can talk specifically about your specific situation. Do either of you guys have anything you wanna to add to that? 
Um, yeah, I guess just two things. One, there is a process to restart your PFS, your Pamela Fellows, sorry. Uh, give Katie a call on that if you are interested or Tanya. Um, for life, again, you just got to check with the institution. Um, but just know that every semester you spend out of state is still considered a semester that you use or that's been used, whether you got money or not. So if you were out of state for a year and you come back, you'd have a max of three years left for life. The other thing is you're still responsible for the credit hours and GPA while you're out of state. So if you come back to state, if you had a 2.0 while you were out of state, when you come back here for life scholarship purposes, you still have a 2.0. There's no start over for the um, for the life scholarship. So just know you got to meet the criteria, even if you're out of state. Uh, the next question, I have a student who is in a diploma program. 45 credits are needed to graduate. She has earned 31 credits at the end of spring. She's enrolled in 12 credits for summer. Is she eligible to receive the life for the summer term? Okay. Um, <laughs> hmm. um, this feels like an institution putting us on the spot in the middle of the call. Um, um, <laughs> all right, so it's a diploma program, uh, 45 credit hours needed to graduate, 31 hours earned at the end of the spring. Uh, my first question would be, how many terms is a diploma program? Is it a two, is it a one-year diploma program, or is it longer than that? You still only have the certain, a set number of terms or semesters based on the program. So as long as we're still in the limits of the program, um, there is an opportunity in a lot of cases for a student to use um, life or Pamela Fellows over the summer. Um, I'm probably not going to answer this specific question. Maybe, maybe you can send me an email directly online. I would say there is an opportunity for any student to possibly use summer funding for state scholarships as long as they continue to put that in the state budget. Um, it is in there for this current year. We're still waiting until the budget is approved for next year. The requirements to use the funding over the summer are to be full-time at one institution. And you also have to have met the criteria at the end of spring. So if this student is in the first year of a diploma program and it's not a two semester diploma program, um, the requirements will be a 3.0 and 30 credit hours. If they've met that at the end of the spring, there may be an opportunity uh, for the for the summer as well. Um, so I think that's probably my answer. I'll stop there. But if you want to send me a, a direct email, we can discuss this a little bit further, I think. Thank you, Dr. Hampton. Um, the next question, it says, I'm going into my junior year in the fall and my major is biology. Are there any scholarships that I could get for my major? Tanya, do you want to take this one? I will take this one. So potentially, um, we do have a STEM enhancement available. So you do have to be, you have to have the base scholarship. So you either need to have life or Palmetto Fellows. Um, and you have to meet the requirements at the end of each year for that. So those 30 credit hours in the 3.0 institutional or life GPA. Uh, you also had to have earned 14 credit hours of math or science during your first academic year in college and be enrolled in an eligible major. Um, if you've met the base scholarship, you have those 14 credit hours of math or science and you're in an eligible major, talk to your financial aid office and you may be eligible for the STEM enhancement. Um, they determine that eligibility and apply that to your account. Thank you, Tanya. Um, can, the next question, can you have a South Carolina need-based grant one year and lose it even if you have met the requirements? So I'm gonna take this one. This is where it gets tricky because for the way the South Carolina need-based grant is set up, um, we allocate the funds to the institution. So the statute and the regulations set what the minimum requirements are but it gives the institutions the authority to set their own awarding parameters. So a lot of times um, it's first come first served. So if there is a delay in filing the free application for federal student aid, that can cause a student to not be able to get funding the next year. And it's not that they didn't do anything academically related. It's just that all the funds were already awarded. 
Um, so what I would say in this scenario, if you had it one year and you didn't get it the next year, please contact your financial aid office, determine if any adjustments were made in the awarding parameters that caused you to no longer be eligible for the Palmetto Fellows. It could be just as simple as the date you filed your free application for federal student aid, or it could be um, that their own awarding parameters have changed and therefore you are no longer eligible. So um, we have the minimum requirements, but then the institution set, uh, they have the ability to set additional requirements on top of those. And we don't have any way of knowing what their awarding requirements are by year. Um, the next question says, so a Palmetto Fellow Scholarship is only available to students who have been to high school in South Carolina. So that is not um, completely accurate. Um, we do have some South Carolina residents who attend high schools out of state for various reasons. Um, it could be a private high school that they're attending out of state. It could be that their their families in the military and South Carolina is their um, state of residence. So we have multiple different scenarios where we have South Carolina residents who attend high school out of state. But as Dr. Hampton had stated earlier in the state in determining residency, um, the student has to be a South Carolina resident at the time of high school graduation and college enrollment. So when we look at Palmetto Fellows, we will process applications based on merit. Um, if the student has met the merit requirements to be determined a Palmetto Fellow, and at that point in time, it goes to the Institution of Higher Education, and their residency officer will work with the student and the family through the residency process and determine if that student meets the residency requirements in order to receive Palmetto Fellows funding. Um, the next question is also Palmetto Fellows. We should probably split these up a little bit. Um, my child currently has a Palmetto Fellows and has accommodations for a disability, but I don't believe my child has the reduced course load accommodation. Is this the only available at the beginning of each year? My child is signed up for summer school to meet hours and would like to drop the class student currently has a 3.0. So you're going to have to speak to your institution. So um, it will vary by institution. Some institutions hold, um, have very strict deadlines on when a reduced course load accommodation can be put into place. Um, it usually does not get applied after the fact, but that is going to have to be up to your institution's um, Office of Accessibility Services to determine what that accommodation is for your student. So that's going to go um, back to your institution to determine, and then um, it'll be up to your institution's financial aid office to determine if that student has met the, the eligibility requirements for next year. Um, the next question. <laughs> My student was awarded a South Carolina need-based grant after filling out the free application for federal student aid the next year. Does that same amount automatically get renewed in the student's financial aid account or does the amount award amount change or get taken away based on, um, so it's gonna, or get taken away based on data in the, in the FAFSA application. So it's going to vary based on the institution, unfortunately. So um, as we stated before, it is possible that a student could get the South Carolina need-based grant one year and then not receive it the next year. So there is no automatic renewal, um, unfortunately. So you would need to fill out the FAFSA application um, and you would need to work with your institution to determine if the student is eligible, what the award amount is. So part of the institution's authority in the awarding parameters is they set, um, they can choose what amount they are awarding. So in some circumstances, because we run out of funding, um, need-based funding, they have the ability to set a, a reduced award amount to try and award more students. So that is up to your institution. So I would suggest you contact your financial aid office at your institution. Um, the next question is, if I applied for the FAFSA and got awarded but didn't go to college, 
that year, does that count as taking up financial aid? Um, so this is, um, I mean, I'm not 100% clear on the question in terms of using the financial aid that would have been awarded from the FAFSA application. The answer is no, you didn't receive the financial aid. However, in terms of our terms of enrollment and our usage, if you had already enrolled and started your clock and then just did not attend, that could affect um, your remaining terms of eligibility. Um, does anybody have anything they wanna add to that as well? No, okay, all right. <laughs> Thanks guys. <laughs> Um, can you please restate your phone number? Tanya, when you go ahead and move to the next slide, I think our phone numbers are on the next slide. There we go. Um, there's our phone number and emails for each one of us. Um, next question. I have had the life scholarship for the 22, 23 year, but it was not offered to me for this summer, even though I am taking eight credits and had a 4.0 for other semesters. Is that something I have to apply for or is the eight credits not considered full-time? Dr. Hampton. No, you want me to do it? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so um, in order to be full-time, you have to be full-time in order to receive a disbursement of state scholarship funding. Full-time credits are set by your institution um, it's usually around 12 credit hours, but you will need to verify that with your institution. You will also have to request them to use that term for the summer, and that will use one of your terms of eligibility. So if you're working on a four-year bachelor's degree, that summer term would be one of your eight terms of eligibility. Is there anything that um, Dr. Hampton or Ms. Weigold would like to add? Okay. Um, is the next question, is the information technology not computer science major considered for a life STEM enhancement and do the dual enrollment credits from high school count towards the math and science enhancement requirements? I got this, Katie. I got it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll give you a small break. Um, so this is a great question. It will depend on what institution you attend. So we have a list of eligible majors on our website. So again, our website is che.sc.gov. You would go to our scholarships page, scroll down to the bottom to the life program, and then click on STEM enhancement. And it will list all of our eligible programs. So, you know, information technology may be an eligible program at institution A, but it may not be an eligible program at institution B. So it really depends on what institution you're at to answer your first question. And then second, yes dual enrollment credits do count towards your math and science enhancement requirements. Um, regardless of if you're a Palmetto Fellow or LIFE, those dual enrollment do count toward enhancement requirements. Thank you, Tanya. Um, so go ahead and keep your mic on. The next question is for you. Is LTAP only available to students that have been in South Carolina originally, or is it available to transfer students that have moved here? It's a great question. Um, <laughs> I believe that you would have to um, earn your South Carolina residency before you are eligible for, well, I know you have to be a South Carolina resident before you get any state aid. Um, so I believe you would have to become a South Carolina resident, um, which we can talk to you offline about uh, in order to be eligible for app LTAP later. Um, but Dr. Hampton, I am gonna have to refer to you <laughs> to clarify. <laughs> Uh, you did a great job. Oh, well, thank uh, you. So LTAP and NEED-based are the two programs out of the five that you can gain residency while you're in college and then participate in those programs. Um, only the three scholarships require you to be a resident at the time of high school graduation. So if you were not a resident when you graduated high school, uh, you could potentially in the future participate in the lottery tuition assistance or NEED-based grant programs. Uh, but as always, as Ms. Weigel said, definitely check with your institution um, to be sure those res residency requirements are met and then that you have FAFSAs on file for those programs. Thank you. Um, so our next question, 
Um, I was not in South Carolina at high school, so I know I do not qualify for the scholarships being discussed. Are there any scholarships or grants specifically for business management or have any advice on where to find legitimate scholarships or grants? Um, so I'll start this and then if you guys have anything you want to add, you can chime in. Um, your number one resource is always going to be your financial aid office. And obviously they're going to award institutional, federal, and state, but a lot of the financial aid offices also have an area where they keep information for what is typically termed a private scholarship search. Um, there are numerous websites now like scholarships.com. Um, I don't know of anything specifically for business management, um, but there are multiple avenues out there um, that you can do a search for private scholarships. It is going to be time consuming. I would suggest that you consider it a part-time job. Um, anything that has an essay, I would say apply for because most students will skip that. So your chances would be improved on that if they are not completing the essay requirements. Um, but I would tell you to be cognizant, do your research, determine if it is a valid website. Um, do not provide bank information or social security number information um, when you're doing that search. But I would definitely encourage you to start with your financial aid office. They may have a list or a, a web page or even a, a binder in their office where they have valid um scholarship searches for, for private searches. Do, is, do you guys have anything you want to add to that? Yeah. If you want to send an email to scholarships at che.sc.gov, um, we have a list of outside scholarship um, companies like College Board or Fast Web that offer um, private scholarships that we can provide you. Um, I'm happy to, to email those out. Thanks, Tanya. And then we, I think we've reached our last question. Um, I graduated high school many years ago and recently started a college program. Can I qualify for the life or the South Carolina hope if I meet the hour and GPA requirements? Dr. Hampton, closing us up. <laughs> okay. Um, so based on statute and regulation with the programs, there is not a requirement that you start college immediately for the life or the hope programs. Um, I would say this, and we say this all the time, a student can take time off after high school graduation as long as they, uh, one, don't change their residency or lose their residency. And you gotta remember, we're talking about residency at the time of graduation and the start of college. So that could be your parents' residency in most cases if you were dependent at that time. And then the other thing is, again, it's gotta be true time off. So you could not have earned any college credits during this time period. And now a lot of students like to take a class here or there, um, you know, just to stay in the college or stay in the school mode, uh, that would automatically start a student's clock. So there's a possibility. Um, there's also some er other hurdles you have to get over uh, working with your institution to produce a valid high school transcript and then a test score, depending on what school you're going to or class rank. Um, so there's also other things you got to look at, but just not starting college by itself is not going to disqualify you, disqualify you from the hope or life scholarships. But again, there's some other things you want to follow up on. Um, I am actually going to acknowledge uh, Dr. Karen Woodfalk um, on this one. Um, if she has anything she'd like to add other, uh, or just say hi to the group, um, Dr. Woodfalk is our director here in the Office of Student Affairs. And um, was here long before me, emphasis on long. So there may be some, some things she might want to add. She has a wonderful speed limit analogy she likes to throw every throw in every now and then. Oh so my God. Well, address the group. I won't I won't do that. I won't do that at all. But I think everyone who's uh, participated, I think we'll do more of these. Um, it seems like there were a lot of great questions today. So thank you for your participation. And I want to thank our panelists, um, uh, Ms. Tanya Weigold, uh, Ms. Catherine Harris and Dr. Garrett Hampton. Uh, again, a lot of these questions need a little bit deeper inquiry. So uh, we encourage you to call us or send us an email. Um, there we are on the screen. So thank you very much.